Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Federalist Society's 13th Annual Faculty Conference. I am Lee Liberman Otis. I am a Senior Vice President and Director of our Faculty Division. And you've probably by now also met uh, Anthony Deirdorf, our new Deputy Director of the Faculty Division, and Barrett Young, the Associate Director of the Faculty Division. If anybody needs anything during the course of the conference, please do find any of us and we'll do anything that we can to uh, help out. Um, without further ado, I would like to turn this over to Brian to uh, say a few words about Richard Nagaretta, who uh, for the past uh, 13 years, including this program, uh, has helped, uh, had helped us put together uh, these conferences. Uh, so, Brian. Thank you, Lee. Um, as, as many of you know, uh, Richard Nagareta passed away in October at the age of 47. Um, he was a professor of complex litigation at Vanderbilt, where I teach. Um, he had also taught evidence and torts over the years when he was at um, Georgia Law School. Um, Richard was my mentor on the uh, Vanderbilt faculty. Uh, he was single-handedly responsible uh, for my being hired uh, at Vanderbilt. And for the last five years, uh, he was my dear, uh, dear friend. Um, I will miss Richard a great deal, as will all of his colleagues students and family members. Uh, Richard's most defining trait was his selflessness and generosity to others. He always thought of himself last. Uh, for this reason, I know I'm not alone in wishing I had a few more minutes uh, to spend with Richard so I could make sure he knew how grateful I am for everything he's done for me, uh, how important he was in my life, and how much I admired him. Uh, Richard was a strong conservative, uh, one of a, only a handful of them in academia and certainly a small handful on the Vanderbilt faculty. Uh, he was a law clerk to Doug Ginsburg on the D.C. Circuit. He served in the Office of Legal Counsel um, in the first Bush administration. And as Lee uh, noted, he was a um, Federal Society member in good standing. Um, he, um, as one of uh, his colleagues who is not a Federal Society member in good standing uh, put it. Um, I don't know how things work over at Federal Society headquarters, uh, but Richard Shirley had reached the level of Eagle Scout or Grand High Lord Protector or whatever title they bestow on their most eminent eminences. And it's true. Uh, Richard has been very active in the society. He was on one of the executive committees among many other uh, things. Uh, Richard was a leader. Uh, in his field of complex uh, litigation. He had his own case book. He had a normative book published by University of Chicago Press, many, many articles in the Harvard Law Review and other places. Uh, the capstone of his career was his recent work as a reporter for the ALI project on aggregate litigation, which uh, is a monumental work that's going to change aggregate litigation uh, forever. Um, you know, uh, as a, a good a Federal Society member in good standing, Richard uh, was known for having a healthy skepticism of uh, the plaintiff's bar and its zeal to turn to litigation uh, to solve uh, the world's problems. Uh, Richard was a very serious man. Uh, he held himself and others to high standards, uh, very high standards. He was serious not only about the law, uh, but as many of you know, he was also serious about his attire. Uh, he dressed impeccably every single day. He was famous for his cufflinks, uh, not just his Ronald Reagan cufflinks that he wore to irk his colleagues at Vanderbilt, um, but he uh, matched his cufflinks very carefully every day to uh, the rest of his attire. Um, those of us on the faculty that <laughs> did not dress as impeccably often heard from Richard about that fact. Um, on, on my second day at Vanderbilt, which was in the middle of June, you know, 90 degree weather in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, on my second day when I would replaced the khakis I'd worn on my first day with shorts, uh, Richard pronounced me a lost cause. Um, he uh, often chided those of us on the fac on, uh, those of us junior faculty who wore suits without ties as Miami Vice look. Uh, and uh, I just want to make it known to, to, to Richard today that I am here in a tie for you, uh, Richard. Um, I, was, I once asked Richard uh, why he went through so much trouble every day to dress as well as he did, and he had a ready answer for me. He said, 
because I want people to know when they see how carefully I dress that whatever I have to say has been the product of at least as much careful deliberation. And uh, that uh, ended up making sense to me after all. Um, as serious as Richard was, he also had a terrific sense of humor. He loved movies. Uh, he loved to toss quotations from movies in his work and in the classroom. He loved to impersonate movie characters, uh, including Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, he had movie-inspired nicknames for his colleagues. Uh, uh, one of his uh, uh, colleagues, uh, his, uh, really his own, his own mentor, he called his Sith Lord. Uh, uh, there was a group of Vanderbilt colleagues that he called the, uh, dawn, the, five dawn, the, the Dawns of the Five Families. Um, uh, 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 but, you know, willing, willing to be outdone um, at the end of every one of Richard's classes that he taught, um, every course at the end of the, of, of the semester, he always held a, a contest uh, complete with a $100 prize uh, for, in, for, for the student in the class who could best impersonate Richard Nagareta. And uh, those were always fun classes uh, to attend. Um, it's impossible to do justice in a few minutes uh, to a man who meant so much to so many. Um, everyone who came into contact with Richard was touched in some way by his intelligence, his work ethic, and his generosity. Um, I do not think I can say it any better than uh, John Goldberg recently said it. John, who teaches now at Harvard, was one of Richard's colleagues at Vanderbilt, and I, I think he really did put it um, uh, best. He said that, uh, John said, in academic writing, there's a now familiar character known as the free writer. Uh, he's the one who benefits from the hard work of others without doing any work himself. Law professors and lawyers spend a lot of time worrying about free riders and how to discourage them. So far as I know, we've never developed a counterpart, the free rider's mirror image. I'll go ahead and call him the full fare rider. The full fare rider is the one who subsidizes everyone else's traveling at a discount. It's only because he pays more than he should. Too much, way too much, the rest of us get by on the cheap. Richard was the full fair writer. He did everything and did it exceedingly well. Husband, father, teacher, scholar, colleague, citizen, mentor, friend. He gave all that he had to give. Richard is survived by his mother, his wife Ruth, his young son Evan. Uh, my heart goes out to them for their loss. There will be no one again quite like Richard Nagareta. Thank you very much. So um, the first panel that we have today is a panel that Richard originally organized, um, and it's a panel uh, that I've agreed uh, to moderate um, in his absence. Um, the panel is on class actions, arbitration, and alternative litigation finance. Um, this panel is going to cover um, what I think are some of the most important developments in um, civil justice. Um, broadly, not just in the class action area. Um, in particular, it's going to uh, discuss alternative litigation finance, which is a, a very new development where um, uh, investors, investment funds, have started to place um, their um, money um, into litigation, buying claims, investing in um, uh, investing in actions um, in court. And this is a very new development and has very broad implications for our civil justice system and for class actions in particular. So we're going to hear about that on this panel. We're also going to hear about um, developments in arbitration uh, and uh, how arbitration uh, interacts with class action cases and the implications that arbitration clauses uh, have for class actions. There's a very important Supreme Court case this term uh, AT&T Mobility v. Concepcion, which has the um, uh, potential to radically, I think, reshape uh, class action litigation um, in this country. So to um, talk to us about these developments in uh, litigation finance and arbitration, we have a very distinguished panel with us today. Uh, sitting to my left is uh, Larry Cunningham, who's a, a professor at George Washington uh, Law School. Uh, we have next to him Anthony Seabuck, who teaches at Cardozo in um, New York. Um, and then we have Steve Ware, who teaches at uh, Kansas Law School. And I'm going to give each of them 15 minutes uh, to address uh, some of these topics of the panel. And uh, then we will uh, turn it over uh, for the last 45 minutes uh, to questions and answers. And I'd like to start things off by recognizing um, 
uh, Professor Seebuck to uh, talk to us a little bit about this very new and very important development of uh, litigation finance. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me. I'm going to take a small portion of my 15 minutes to mention that Richard Nagarita was also uh, a friend of mine. Um, I represent, I suppose, uh, uh, an aspect of Richard which is quite unusual. I'm not um, a member of the Federal Society in, in, in spirit. Uh, that will be clear from my comments probably. Richard uh, has was somebody who reached out to me um, and maintained an extraordinarily rich personal and intellectual friendship over the last many years. And, uh, and it was uh, the best of academia, really, the way that he and I could interact, um, despite our differences of opinion about many things. I just never looked at his cufflinks when he wore those Ronald Reagan <laughs> cufflinks. Um, and he didn't look at my um, tieless attire, I suppose. Uh, and there's a way in which he is definitely a paragon. He is a paragon of even-mindedness and of fairness and of intellectual engagement and of generosity. And I wish all of us could be like him. Now, I'm going to uh, talk about a topic that I have approached um, from two levels. And I'm going to cheat you out of probably one of those two levels, unless you ask me during questions for more information. Um, I have been writing about alternative litigation finance for a few years now uh, from both a, a jurisprudential and a practical point of view. And I'm going to talk mostly today from a jurisprudential point of view. I think this audience will appreciate that. It's not often I get to talk about Blackstone and Ames to people who've actually read Blackstone and Ames. Um, but I am certainly uh, very aware, both in my academic and in my private consulting capacity, of the industry that's out there, because I have dealt with that industry a great deal. Um, and I will talk a little bit about that industry at the very end of my comments. But I'm not here to talk about the industry and its nuts and bolts today. I'm here to talk about the conceptual underpinnings that lay behind the um, common law and the statutory uh, prohibitions on alternative litigation finance that currently exist in the United States. Uh, uh, certainly they are um, being loosened but they still exist, and I'm going to talk about certain jurisdictions, which I think are good examples of the approximately um, 23 states that still have some form of prohibition against um, the most popular form of alternative litigation finance, which is uh, champerty, which is the investment in a lawsuit for profit. Now, uh, I'm going to start at the most broad level and move down to a more narrow level. Uh, and the most broad level is uh, when we use this expression, which was actually created by the Rand Corporation when they had their um, maiden voyage of their new project on, uh, on long capital markets. That's originally what it was called when Rand started this two years ago, long capital markets. But then they issued a report, which is a very good report, which, which dubs this industry really the industry of ALF. Not a stuffed character from a TV sitcom from the 1970s, but um, alternative litigation finance. And uh, there was some controversy. I was part of this country. The word alternative is itself a, a, a loaded title. I actually think it's interesting. It's by accident, I think, very, very um, profound that they chose that because it helps us understand that we need to ask al alternative to what? And of course, it's alternative to what in the uh, uniquely American approach to how litigation is financed in contrast to other common law systems and especially civilian systems. And the answer is in the United States, it's, it's, al it's the alternative to lawyer funding. That's what alternative litigation finance is. It's the alternative to lawyer funding, plaintiff's lawyers investing their own time and money in litigation. But actually, from the common law's point of view, when we go back and look at the prohibitions on ALF, um, it's really actually an alternative to self-funding, to the idea not just that the person who, um, uh, who, uh, who suffered the wrong would, on their own bottom, this is a, this is a term from a case from uh, 1830, uh, someone who brings a suit on their own bottom, um, like a ship, I guess, somehow coming to ground around on a sandbar. It's not a good image. But uh, Lord Abinger referred to how um, we only want to have suits go forward that are brought on their own bottom. Um, but really, the idea here is uh, funding becomes a proxy uh, for interest. Uh, and the question about alternative uh, litigation finance um, even from way back in the 18th and, uh, and 19th centuries was um, wh um, whose interest is being served? Uh, if, if a lawsuit is brought um, 
And, and does it matter whose interest is being served? Does society care about whose interest is being served? Now, um, ALF, I'm going to use the expression ALF. ALF can be criticized uh, from a number of different perspectives. Uh, and, and depending on the critical perspective you adopt, it shows a sort of greater and lesser degree of skepticism about how important it is that there be a kind of genuine, or as I've called it recently in an article in the Vanderbilt Law Review, an authentic claim being brought, a claim that comes uh, uniquely from the person who suffered the wrong. So I'm going to run, run through some questions that you could ask yourself when you think about different forms of ALF. Um, and they begin at the most broad, and maybe, not, and maybe they don't strike you as very controversial, but they're going to get more and more controversial as you narrow down to the more modern practices. So here's the first. Should society care that the party bringing a meritorious claim, and we're not talking about frivolous claims, a meritorious claim, is not the party who suffered the wrong? Second, um, should, the, should it matter that the party who suffered the wrong um, that is now the subject of a lawsuit would not have brought the claim on their own? And does it matter why they wouldn't have brought the claim? Um, maybe is it because they wouldn't have been inclined? Is it because they just would have lumped the loss? Because they didn't think they were sufficiently injured, although they were injured. Does it matter that they wouldn't bring the claim? Because they didn't have the resources. They couldn't find the resources, whether they be the legal resources, the evidence, or the money to get the claim uh, moving. Another question. Um, should it matter that the party bringing a meritorious claim, and, and who suffered the wrong, is bringing it? So now we shift over, and now we're back to someone who is bringing a claim that is meritorious, who did suffer the wrong. But does it matter that the only reason they're bringing it is because they received support from a stranger who is not a lawyer, not their lawyer? And, and if that support was non-monetary, <clears throat> encouragement, information, um, does it matter that the information or the support was um, introduced by that stranger, that the, that the motivation to introducing that resource, that non-monetary resource, um, uh, was motivated by the stranger's desire to, so to speak, officiously intermeddle in the subject of the lawsuit for whatever their reason might be. And you might think now about NAACP versus Button. That was exactly what the issue was in NAACP versus Button. Um, or taking the more common practice, now the one that Brian was originally talking about, um, should it matter to us uh, that someone who's bringing a lawsuit is bringing it only because a stranger has chosen to officiously intermeddle and the stranger's decision to officiously intermeddle is motivated purely by a monetary self-interest. They just want to make money. They could have actually, if it was possible, have supported the other side had they been able to find a way to invest on the other side of the case. But they just found an easier way to invest on this side of the case because they thought this side of the case was more likely to prevail and they had an opportunity to invest. And finally, and this one now we're getting to the most practical problems that are being faced today, um, assuming that all the other questions can be answered to your satisfaction and none of these things bother you, should it matter to society that a party who's bringing a meritorious claim, who suffered a wrong, a real wrong, right, um, is doing so only because an outsider is helping them, officiously intermeddling with money, um, but in so doing, the party bringing the claim, who suffered the original wrong, um, is, bringing, is giving up control over that claim, control over the lawsuit, control, say, over settlement, or control over lawyer selection or some other issue. Okay. Now, these are the questions, in sort of descending a cascade of less to more objectionable, what people find objectionable when you begin to talk to them, and what legislators find worry them and what courts begin to get worried about. These are the questions which I'm dealing with at the most abstract level and which actually have answers in the common law and in the statutes that we have today in the 50 jurisdictions in England and also almost nothing in federal law. Now, interestingly, um, early English common law uh, and statutory law, mostly common law, judges um, took an extraordinarily hostile position to all of these questions. Okay, as you may be aware of, um, it was in fact uh, prohibited for one person to assign to another a chosen action until relatively recently in English law, until by statutory amendment in the, 18th century, in the 19th century. Now this rule was actually never adopted in the US. Uh, there's a couple of well-known cases 
um, in Massachusetts in uh, 1861, the Supreme Judicial Court noted, well, over there in England, you weren't allowed to assign tort claims, you weren't allowed to assign most contract claims, you could only assign a handful of property claims. But we're not going to do that because, as the court put it in 1861, uh, the necessities of commerce and trade in the U.S. and in the, in, in the colonies required an abandonment of this early, very, very strict hostile prejudice against a stranger getting involved at all in another person's lawsuit. And the reason I bring up assignment, you may say, well, why is he talking about assignment? Well, because assignment is actually a form of ALF. Okay? Because what it is, is that the whole claim is being wholly funded by someone other than the party who suffered the wrong. It is a form of alternative litigation funding. It's, a, it's an extreme form, it's a complete form, and it may be a form that you find completely uncontroversial today. But I want to say two things. It is ALF, and it was very controversial. Um, as early as 1800 in both the United States and in England. Now, the remaining restrictions on ALF are um, on a more narrow basis. They're, they're basically uh, directed against something called maintenance, okay, uh, which is not complete assignment of the claim, but rather a uh, acceptance of aid, support, what I call the support of the officious under meddler, in exchange for a uh, contingent future interest in the recovery of the lawsuit. Uh, or just actually out of pure munificence or out of pure bloody-mindedness. There are cases of maintenance where people are helping litigants merely because they hate the other person who the litigant is suing. Okay. Now, maintenance uh, is currently uh, prohibited in many jurisdictions. And I'm going to read to you a typical statute, Illinois. Uh, excuse me if I just take a little time to read a statute. It helps. We get some real statutes in the world here. Um, maintenance. It, if a person officiously intermeddles in an action that is in no, that in no way belongs or con, or to or concerns that person by maintaining or assisting either party with money or otherwise to prosecute or defend the action with a view to promote litigation, he or she is guilty of maintenance. And then there's a caveat. Uh, you can do this if the person you're helping is a relative or a servant or a poor person and you're doing it out of charity. Okay? Now, what could possibly be the rationale? for a law like that. And this law is not unique. There's a, it's not exactly reprodu reproduced in other states, but I can find examples of it in a number of other states. And it goes all the way back to Blackstone. I mean, Blackstone was a great fan of prohibiting maintenance. And his argument was, uh, and by the way, for those of you who are in the federal society circles, this is something which Steve Kresser has written about, and he completely endorses this position. I completely reject it, so now you know where I stand. Um, so according to Kresser, he's absolutely right. Blackstone hated this. Why? Because according to Blackstone, this is a quote from Blackstone, maintenance is, uh, being, uh, is, 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 is a wrong. It's a wrong in society because being an officious, inter being, it is an act of being an officious intermeddler in a suit that in no way belongs to one by maintaining or assisting either party with money or otherwise. He defines exactly what Illinois just said. That's what maintenance is. And why is this bad? It's because it's an offense against public justice is it keeps alive strife and contention and perverts the remedial process of the law into an engine of oppression. Now, Blackstone feels very strongly about this. Um, so do many states. Note that there's some confusion here. Uh, some people might think, oh, I see what's going on here. This is really an, a concern about what we now call the tort of the wrongful use of civil proceedings, Restatement Section 674. No. Okay? I mean, that particular piece of the restatement actually requires that the civil action, which is at issue, be brought without any foundation, and the person who's, doing, who's either bringing the suit or supporting the suit knows it doesn't have a foundation. And I didn't talk about that. I'm talking about suits that actually have facially a claim that have a foundation, and that there's a good faith belief in that. Okay? We, so let's just take away restatement section 674. Um, maybe it's like the tort of abusive process, which doesn't require knowing that the, the suit lacks a foundation. Maybe it's like the tort of abusive process, a very slippery little tort. But that's the malicious use of an otherwise valid legal procedure for an improper end. Now, Blackstone did not say that it has to be, you know, that maintenance involves a malicious use uh, of the legal system, even if you know the claim is well-founded. And it doesn't have to say there's an improper end. And, and, and in fact, many of the courts that support the doctrine of maintenance or the rule against maintenance do not require anything like abusive process. They do not require anything like um, malicious use of uh, litigation or an improper end. And I'm going to give you an example, an 1850 case from Illinois. Um, 
says, the law will not tolerate a principle which will allow a man to litigate, oh, man, sorry, will allow a man of a litigious disposition to go about the community hunting up stale claims even if meritorious. Okay? Now you say, oh, 1850, so long ago. Well, actually, that case was cited in support for a decision by a federal court in Illinois in 2009. That case was cited in support to knock down the assignment of a consumer claim from a person who suffered the allegedly the consumer claim to a stranger. And the court said, you can't do that. That's maintenance. Um, and they went back and cited this 1850 case. Um, now, so if we were to take all these ideas and boil them down, it seems to me that what people are truly concerned about is, and to take seriously the language of Blackstone, to take seriously the language of the courts, is the resurrection by a stranger or the encouragement by a stranger of something called a stale claim. A claim which is meritorious, but a claim which on its own would not have been brought forward but for the involvement of a stranger. But for the involvement of a stranger. And the question then is, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with a stranger being the catalyst of a claim that has merit going forward? And to my surprise, even the New York Times doesn't like this idea. So the New York Times had a very long argue, uh, article. Actually, it's a two-part series, soon to be a multi-part series, about the litigation finance industry. They came out with an article in November. And one of their marquee examples was a case called Del Webb versus MC Mojave, which is a district court case out of Nevada. Nevada has exactly the same law Illinois has. And uh, they uh, presented a case where, when you boiled down the facts and got rid of the irrelevant stuff, some of which was very, very ugly examples of uh, illegal solicitation by a law firm, but take that away. The actual claim in violation of Nevada's maintenance rules that was the ground of the decision and which New York Times was using the case as its illustration for it, okay, um, was that uh, the defendant, uh, a stranger, not a lawyer, gave something of value, an inspection of a house, a free inspection of a house, in exchange for contingent future recovery that if the homeowner then used that information to bring a consumer claim, uh, they would then re receive not just the value of their labor, but actually a, a, a bonus as well, a bounty. Okay? They were little bounty hunters. And the New York Times points out as like, clearly very worrisome. We just don't want to have a system in which strangers are encouraged to be bounty hunters by encouraging people who have legitimate claims who would uh, otherwise be interested in bringing these claims to bring them into the courts. And uh, my question is, well, why not? Uh, this, has, this is an interesting problem. I have no idea why this would be a bad thing. Actually, I think it's an interesting thing for the federal society to think about because um, what we have here is we have a collision between two very different value systems. I mean, one, of course, is an anxiety about litigation as a, as a burden on society because it has all these negative externalities. On the other hand, these are, uh, we hope, um, um, fully competent adults who are engaging in contracts, who are trying to engage in what can only be described as profitable activities because um, labor is being used to provide something of value to another person. It seems to me an extremely good expression of the free enterprise system. And unless there is deceit, unless there is a fraud in the court being played, unless there is uh, some other kind of consumer-oriented concerns that we have, I'm not quite sure why the state should be in the, in the position of trying to prohibit or restrict these activities. Now, I promised you that I was going to give you two parts of this discussion, the theoretical and the practical. I have one minute left. I'll talk to you really briefly about the practical, okay? Um, about half the jurisdictions in the United States are permitting forms of outside investment litigation and most of it looks nothing like what I talked about today. Here's what's really happening in the real world. In the real world, there are two sectors, the consumer and the commercial sector. The consumer sector is where outside investors are taking lawsuits that have already been filed, mostly small value personal injury suits, and they're monetizing them. They're not encouraging lawsuits at all. The lawsuits have already been filed. What they're basically doing is they're offering someone um, a, uh, a non-recourse loan. I give you $10,000 if you recover uh, next year on your personal injury claim over $30,000, you give me back 20, okay? That is the uh, consumer sector and it's very, very broadly used now across the United States and all the states that don't have prohibitions on maintenance or champerty. Um, what's really interesting, what's emerging, which I think is now causing a lot of concern, is the commercial sector. Because the commercial sector is different. The commercial sector is where investors go and set up the conditions for a lawsuit. They do exactly what, in some sense, Blackstone was concerned about. They take claims, whether stale or not, but they take claims that would not otherwise be brought, and they fund them. 
and but for the funding, the, state, the claims would not be brought. Now, here's what's interesting about the commercial sector. The commercial sector as it exists today is actually really about commercial litigation. It's not about personal injury litigation. It's not about class action litigation. I've never seen a class action case be funded this way. I have seen hundreds of commercial claims between businesses be funded this way because businesses cannot afford the hourly rates of their commercial litigators and they can't get personal, they can't get plaintiff's attorneys to take these cases on a contingency basis, especially the contract cases. Now the question is, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with someone coming in with $400,000 and saying, I'll stake you $400,000 to pay your fancy DC lawyers and if you get more than $3 million out of this case, you've got to give me back 800000 That's the industry that's growing today. That's the real world of ALF. And that's what's growing and what's, what's actually now subject to a great deal of scrutiny by the media and other policy concerns. Um, and with that, I'll end, and I'll be happy to take questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Seabach. As I, as I said, I, I think that this development of financing litigation is going to be one of the most important things in the law over the next few years. I'm happy we'll have more time to talk about that um, in the Q&A. Um, to switch uh, gears a bit and to talk uh, now about um, arbitration uh, and the implications that arbitration has for civil justice and in particular class actions and the Supreme Court case that is um, on the docket this, this term, AT&T v. Concepcion, um, I would like to uh, recognize uh, Professor Ware uh, to talk to us about that. Thank you. I guess the uh, first challenge here is to get the equipment uh, working. And so I guess a um, cu couple things. First of all, you, you need to be able to see and you need to be able to hear. So I'm going I'm to ask Randy back in, in the back. Can you hear me fine, Randy? Raise your hand if you can hear me fine. Thank you. Now, I, as to the seeing part, I'm trying to get this on the screen. Let's see here. Oh, I think I need to make the request that I've seen at other conferences because I just saw the computer click when, when I didn't click it, and I'm told that cell phones sometimes do that. It, it, it's, it's, uh, if, 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 you have, if you have a phone on and you're close to the computer here, if you can shut that off. My fault. Thank you. I'm, I'm shutting them off right now. Okay, there we go. Now, now I intended to click that one, so that's, that's good. Okay, I think we got the equipment working now, and we can get into the, uh, to the substance. Uh, Tony just gave us, I thought, a very strong uh, summary of uh, litigation finance. And um, I think it uh, transitions nicely into our next topic, arbitration, uh, which is also um, often viewed as a way to increase access to justice. I like a lot of the alternative litigation finance uh, Tony was talking about because I like the idea of increasing access to justice and that's part of why I like arbitration uh, as, as well. Arbitration not always a way to increase uh, access to justice. Sometimes uh, people argue it's a way to decrease access to justice and we'll, we'll get into that uh, later if, if you like. But I do want to start with just sort of the basics of um, arbitration as a way to uh, increase access to justice, a way to make it more cost effective to bring uh, meritorious claims. The um, empirical data tends to show that arbitration as compared to litigation tends to reduce the process costs of bringing a claim, the process costs of adjudicating. Uh, for example, the pleadings in arbitration tend to be shorter, less legalistic than what you see in litigation. Discovery is a huge category of where arbitration tends to produce cost savings over litigation. Arbitration tends to have much quicker, shorter discovery than, uh, than, than civil litigation. Uh, motion practice, much less a part of arbitration. You typically just skip that step entirely in arbitration. Uh, the trial in court versus the hearing in arbitration. Arbitration tends to be a quicker, um, you might say, more get to the point kind of uh, process. And a lot of that has to do with the evidentiary uh, side of litigation. Arbitration tends to, to not involve a lot of fighting over evidentiary 
issues uh, as opposed to civil litigation, particularly jury trials where those evidentiary issues tend to be a bigger uh, deal. And then finally, appeal, uh, uh, which obviously takes time and money in the litigation system. Uh, arbitration uh, tends to foreclose that by just having a very strong deferential standard that the arbitrator's decision gets confirmed uh, so people don't bother appealing it as much when they, they know they don't have a good chance of, of succeeding on appeal. So the standard story about arbitration is that it's the quick and dirty form of adjudication. It's the way to just get it done quickly and cheaply in contrast to litigation, the more elaborate, uh, more time-consuming, more expensive form of adjudication. That's a uh, that's, uh, standard story and I think there's a lot of truth uh, to it. Now if arbitration has all those uh, good features, uh, you might ask, well, gee, why don't we just send all our cases to arbitration? Uh, why, why have anything go to litigation? Uh, obviously, that would be bad uh, because it would force people into arbitration who don't want to uh, be there. And the current law says uh, that the only way to get a case to arbitration is if the parties uh, agree to take their case to arbitration. So that, that basic idea of consent uh, is really at the foundation of arbitration law. Uh, the way I think of it is that uh, litigation is the default process of adjudication. That's the process that happens unless the parties contract out of the default into something else, uh, such as arbitration. A uh, contract is required to opt out of the default litigation and into uh, arbitration. Now, sometimes parties who already have a dispute form an arbitration agreement. They do this contract where they say, hey, let's take our dispute to arbitration. Let's have an arbitrator rather than a judge or jury resolve our, uh, our case. More often, though, it's parties who do not yet have a dispute that form an arbitration agreement. The parties are forming a contract, and they typically hope there will never be a dispute, but they put an arbitration clause in their contract saying, if we do have a dispute, then it'll be resolved by arbitration rather than litigation. And the basic law here, which has been around for, for several generations now, is that arbitration clauses are enforceable and uh, that they're enforceable with a particularly strong remedy. Uh, it's not money damages. Normally we enforce uh, contracts with a remedy of money damages, but in the arbitration context, the remedy is specific performance. You actually have to perform the promise you made to take your dispute to arbitration. So if a plaintiff sues in court after having formed an arbitration agreement, that plaintiff is breaching the promise to arbitrate the dispute and courts enforce that promise by simply staying or dismissing the litigation, telling the plaintiff the only way for you to get relief on your claim, get a remedy, is to bring your claim in arbitration. In other words, close the courthouse door on that plaintiff, say you've got to go to arbitration if you want some, some remedy here. So that's enforcing the promise to arbitrate with the remedy of specific performance as opposed to money damages. And the same thing if the shoe's on the other foot. If it's the defendant who doesn't want to arbitrate, the plaintiff is saying to the defendant, hey, let's go to arbitration. Now, if the defendant refuses to submit to arbitration and participate, the plaintiff can get a court order uh, compelling the defendant to participate in, uh, in arbitration. So we have this strong remedy in our uh, law for enforcing uh, arbitration uh, agreements. And uh, the, um, see if I can get the slide to the next step here. So that's, uh, that's really the um, first two points up here on the screen. Arbitration, what is it? It's a private sector court. And how do disputes get to arbitration? Usually through a pre-dispute arbitration agreement, a, a contract uh, that hasn't yet produced a dispute where the parties are agreeing, if we do have one, we'll take it to arbitration. You see arbitration clauses in a wide variety of contracts. The um, long-standing historical areas where it's been used most is commercial contracts, uh, especially international, transnational commerce. Also, uh, since the uh, 1930s, um, with the rise of uh, labor unions, collective bargaining agreements have uh, typically had arbitration clauses between uh, unions and, and employers. 
And then in the last, I'll say, 20 or 30 years, we've seen the proliferation of arbitration clauses in uh, other sorts of contracts, most uh, controversially uh, consumer uh, co contracts where, where all the concerns of uh, inequality of bargaining power and adhesion contracts and unconscionability and all uh, kick, kick in. So lots of us arbitration folks, we talk about um, uh, the old arbitration, commercial and labor, where people view them as sort of more knowledgeable, equal parties forming them versus the new arbitration, which is the uh, form contract you get with your cell phone or your credit card, that sort of, sort of thing. And then uh, the last point on this uh, screen is after a dispute goes to arbitration, we do have, as I mentioned earlier, a very deferential standard of review courts give to arbitrators' decisions, so the arbitrators' decisions are, are enforced. You see lots of uh, judicial opinions to the effect that uh, the parties uh, bargained for the arbitrator's decision, so the court's not going to look at whether the arbitrator got it right or wrong. The court's just going to rubber stamp the arbitrator's decision because uh, that's what the parties uh, contracted for. Now, where does all this law uh, come from? It comes from the Federal Arbitration Act. And I'm here on the screen have the um, primary substantive provision of the Federal Arbitration Act. It says that arbitration agreements shall be valid, irrevocable, and enforceable, save upon such grounds as exist at law or in equity for the revocation of any contract. So this is kind of an unusual federal statute in that basically what it's doing is telling courts to enforce a certain sort of contract clause, a particular contract clause, the arbitration clause. Um, federal statute telling courts enforce contracts. It's a, it's a pro-contract uh, statute. And um, I think a lot of the issues that we'll be getting into, uh, Larry Cunningham and Brian Fitzpatrick, I, I, I know and I have talked about these issues, where arbitration in the modern world is um, being challenged, I think a lot of what sort of the underlying theme here is we've got this 1920s statute with a pro-contract bent to it that really comes from an era where old-fashioned notions of freedom of contract were more prevalent in the law versus, say, the last 50 years we've seen a proliferation of consumer protection statutes and a very more of a consumer protection mentality. So I think a lot of the issues we'll be getting to here are sort of a clash of these two worldviews. Uh, Federal Arbitration Act embodying an older 1920s freedom of contract worldview versus other bodies of law having a more recent consumer protection uh, attitude. Now, I, I personally uh, am a freedom of contract kind of guy. I like this uh, 1920s uh, statute. And in fact, it's, it's one of the reasons I, as a libertarian, chose to specialize in arbitration law. I, I, I found this to be one of the few areas of law that I could get, uh, get behind. And uh, you, you might say I sort of cling, I might say I sort of cling to this statute. Like President Obama says some conservatives cling to guns and s such, right? I, I cling to the Federal Arbitration Act as, as about, the, uh, about the only libertarian law I could, could find. Uh, so, so in any event, big point I want to make here just as a matter of rhetoric, as a matter of terminology, lots of people call the new arbitration, the credit card and cell phone and such, they call it mandatory arbitration. And that's just wrong. It's contractual arbitration. Yes, it arises out of a form contract presented, take it or leave it, by a business to an individual. But a form contract and adhesion contract is still a contract. Uh, the, the, the consumer has the choice, accept it or, or not. By contrast, there is some really mandatory arbitration. There are some statutes out there that say you've got to arbitrate whether you've contracted for it or, or not. Uh, so that's, that's uh, um, the basics of arbitration. And now to get to the issue that, that I know Brian and L Larry are, are interested in as well, which is class actions. Um, many businesses, typically defendants in lawsuits, 
often argue that by agreeing to arbitrate, plaintiffs have waived their right to bring a class action in either litigation or arbitration. So I think what we're seeing here is two procedural things, arbitration and class actions, both of which at least arguably are designed to increase access to justice. But businesses like the arbitration thing much more than they like the class action thing. And they've discovered that they have a chance of using arbitration agreements to insulate themselves from class actions. However, second bullet point here, many courts have held unconscionable, unenforceable arbitration clauses that do prohibit class actions. So then, as happens where businesses draft in response to court's rulings, many businesses drafted arbitration clauses that are silent on whether class-wide relief is permitted or prohibited. And these silent clauses got a big boost from the U.S. Supreme Court just this year in the Stolt-Nielsen case, which interpreted an arbitration clause silent on class actions as prohibiting them. Supreme Court says, unless the arbitration clause says class-wide relief can be had through arbitration, we're going to interpret the arbitration clause as precluding class-wide relief. So I think the big question there is at the bottom bullet point, will courts hold these silent clauses unconscionable and refuse to enforce them? And I think we'll get guidance real soon from the U.S. Supreme Court on this question in the AT&T Concepcion uh, case which uh, granted cert on this question you see here, uh, does the Federal Arbitration Act preempt states from conditioning the enforcement of arbitration agreement on the availability of particular procedures here, class-wide arbitration, when those procedures are not necessary to ensure that the parties to the arbitration agreement are able to vindicate their claims. The way it's phrased here, I think, is the way AT&T uh, likes it to be, to be phrased. Uh, this case has been argued, not yet decided. We'll see what, uh, what the Supreme Court does. I only have a minute or two left, so I'll just finish with my um, sort of conclusion, which is uh, many people uh, believe that Congress should bar class waivers in arbitration agreements, and many people believe that if the Supreme Court rules in AT&T's favor, that this sort of uh, legislation will get a boost in uh, Congress. Uh, my, my own view, I, I testified before the House and Senate on this uh, question, and, and I expressed the view that Congress should leave the Federal Arbitration Act uh, alone, which is not a view that all arbitration clauses should be enforced all the time. Rather, it's a view that the uh, Federal Arbitration Act has that provision I had up on the screen earlier, enforce an arbitration clause unless there's a ground for the revocation of any contract, fraud, unconscionability, et cetera. So what courts have been doing, and I hope they'll be allowed to continue to do, is a case-by-case -case analysis. Uh, agreements can be written in different ways. Facts of every case are different. Unconscionability is supposed to be a case-by-case -case, uh, specific analysis. So I hope that Congress will leave it and the Supreme Court will leave it that way rather than pushing to an all-or-nothing uh, extreme that they're always enforceable or they're always not enforceable. Uh, since my time is done, I'll just uh, wrap up and turn the floor over to Larry. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ware, for more on arbitrations and the implications for contract law. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, Professor Cunningham. Thanks, Brian. Thanks to everyone. Let me tee this up for one second. I think we're using some old equipment here, so it may take. That's the title of my uh, talk. Um, I've just got a couple of slides. Uh, reading recent Supreme Court opinions in arbitration cases, I got the impression that contract law is so central to arbitration disputes that I've been irresponsible to leave arbitration at the margins of my contracts course, as I've done for nearly two decades. Uh, on closer inspection, though, I found that the court's rhetoric about contract law and arbitration is far stronger than the reality. So it turns out I don't have to add arbitration cases to my contracts course after all. But the discovery of this gap between the rhetoric and the reality did 
pique my curiosity, and the result is a work in progress. Uh, as background, 19th century judges jealously disfavored arbitration. The 1925 Federal Arbitration Act that Steve just excerpted reversed that, saying, as his slide quoted, arbitration clauses should be enforced as other contracts, subject to the same defenses as, quote, any contract. All states have these statutes, and the hostility faded long ago. Nevertheless, the Supreme Court in the 1980s began enthusiastically to embrace the FAA to express a preemptive national policy favoring arbitration. The court once stressed that the FAA's purpose was reversing judicial hostility, but increasingly emphasizes this national policy. That entails liberal interpretation of contracts to encompass arbitration. At the same time, the court bends over backwards to say it is simply enforcing contracts, usually saying it is applying state contract law. Despite that rhetoric, the court's applications differ significantly. Uh, the paper I'm working on documents this rhetoric reality gap and then tries to explain it. Uh, a sampling of the court's rhetoric appears on that screen. Arbitration is a matter of consent, not coercion. Contract interpretation is a matter of state contract law. The FAA's purpose is to make arbitration clauses enforceable according to their terms and so on. It, the talk is all about uh, party consent, party agreement, party design, and so on. In contrast, the court's applications include a dozen examples at odds with this rhetoric and with the common law of contracts. My only other slide gives some examples that I'll summarize. First, presuming parties intend arbitration when expressions are ambiguous, beginning with 1983's Moses Cohn opinion by Justice Brennan. Uh, two, denying party autonomy to choose law other than the FAA, including in 1995's Mastrobuano opinion by Justice Stevens. It said choice of law clauses in contracts capture the substance of state law, but not procedural aspects such as those that might bar arbitrators from awarding punitive damages. Three, limiting freedom of contract, as in 2008's Hall Street opinion by Justice Souter. It denied enforceability of an agreement because it gave parties the right to appeal an arbitration award for judicial review of legal error. Four, limiting freedom from contract by liberally letting strangers enforce them, as in 2009's Arthur Anderson opinion by Justice Scalia. Clients had signed contracts with a management company that contained arbitration clauses to do a tax shelter. The IRS later ruled that illegal. The clients sued their lawyers and accountants who designed it, and those advisors successfully invoked the arbitration clause in that contract to which they were strangers. Five, severing arbitration clauses from allegedly invalid contracts so that unless the clause itself is challenged, arbitrators, not courts, decide the contract's validity, whether challenged as illegal, fraudulent, or unconscionable. And that's true even if the sole content of the contract is about arbitration, such as when it governs an at-will employment arrangement, as in the Renter Center opinion of 2010 by Justice Scalia. And finally, a tendency to deny contract law's richness by taking literally that statutory phrase, any contract, about defenses. St so states may not recognize any defense to an arbitration clause unless it applies to any contract. That tendency appears in several opinions, including, and, and I think looming large, in this term's pending AT&T case. So, wonderment arises. What explains the gap and why might it matter? A likely explanation is how it covers a conflict inherent in the court's jurisprudence. The court says there is a national policy favoring arbitration. That disfavors trial by jury and other due process. To make that national policy valid requires respecting associated rights and traditions. It needs a voluntary basis. That means contracts. But if parties have true freedom of contract, that could interfere with a national policy. They could agree to levels of judicial review for arbitration awards, as they sought to do in Hall Street, and set rules on who can enforce arbitration contracts, as suggested by Arthur Anderson. That tension induces rhetoric about contracts. 
Similarly, advancing a national policy favoring arbitration federalizes an area of law traditionally for the states. That defies federalism. An objection, incidentally, once made, but later withdrawn by both Justices O'Connor and Scalia, leaving Thomas, the lone justice, now supporting federalism in this area. But to maintain respectability of an assertion of national policy, it helps to promote links to state law prerogatives. That means contract law. But again, too much deference to state law would undermine a national policy. States could bar arbitrators from awarding punitive damages, as in the Master Bono case, or allow a range of defenses that don't literally apply to any contract, as in the pending AT&T case. That tension produces rhetoric about contract law. Whatever the reason, and I explore some others in the paper, the rhetoric reality gap has costs. First, any gap between what judges or other public officials do and what they, what they say compromises their legitimacy. One risk of perceived legitimacy of federal actors is state defiance. And one sees on the books in many states statutes that the Supreme Court precedents would declare uh, invalid, preempted. Third, some states knuckle under and change their law but that has a tendency to simply recapture the rhetoric reality gap from the federal jurisprudence into state contract law. Another cost is how this rhetoric reality gap gives contract law a bad name. Critics of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence in this area often say they elevate contracts above other principles like federal jurisdiction and federal courts. And that just gives contract law a bad name. It's not about con it's not contracts, it's causing the trouble. It's the national policy that the rhetoric reality gap is used to disguise. A concrete cost appears in how the logic of the court's position undermines potential defenses of it. For example, some defend the court's jurisprudence, especially that severability rule, in contract law terms of default rule theory. Right? This views contract law as providing gaps to complete incomplete contracts. And in its jurisprudence, the court is merely supplying rules parties likely would choose if they thought about it and that they could change if they want. But suppose a contract says no clause is severable from the rest. If one part is invalid, the whole is invalid. Under default rule analysis, that should negate the court's severability rule, but it's not obvious that the court would do that. After all, it raises the same specter that the severability rule is designed to prevent destroying the national policy favoring arbitration by directing some disputes headed for arbitration back into court. And the court's precedents suggest an easy way to direct arbitration despite such a clause. For example, example, simply diminish the arbitration clause's status in the exchange to mere procedure. As in the Master Bono case, it's easy to imagine why parties might prefer the severability rule for substantive matters so an exchange of cash for both goods and services when the goods cannot be delivered because of some regulation to just decide the entire contract is invalid. But maybe they wouldn't do that with procedural clauses like an arbitration provision. So the court could readily do, refuse to enforce a non-severability clause and still insist that arbitration is a matter of contract. A final problem with this gap is how it impairs the court's capacity to decide whether inferior courts apply contract law consistent with the FAA. And I think this is going to matter a lot in the AT&T case. The issue in the AT&T case, and I think it's fair, the AT&T's um, description of the issue is, as Steve, I'll put it, is, is fine. It's, it's really whether California unconscionability law applies to, quote, any contract. The case involved a form contract where a consumer claimed a fraud of $30 and sought class arbitration, which a contract clause barred in favor of one-on-one -on -one arbitration. California cases call unconscionable clauses that can be used to prevent forming classes to challenge practices like cheating or stealing small sums from large numbers of people. Lower courts in that dispute applied that doctrine to find the class bar unconscionable. 
The court's real challenge in the case is to state a test of preemption. How can the court, or all of us, tell if a law so applied meets the FAA's mandate to treat arbitration clauses like other contracts? A simple way would compare general unconscionability law applied to the run of contracts to its application in this particular setting. That reflects the court's jurisprudence, but it's hard to escape concluding that this California law at issue in the case um, does not apply to any contract. It applies to a distinct species of contracts where it's possible for, to cheat large numbers of people out of small individual sums. But preempting the law on that basis seems a little strange as a matter of contract law. It suggests that contract law is monolithic, that there is the, the possibility of imagining a defense available to any contract. Um, but nevertheless, the Supreme Court's rhetoric suggests that that is a possible position in the pending case. In my view, the court would do well to find a more pragmatic and legitimate uh, approach to assessing the validity of state law under the FAA. But to do that would require abandoning this rhetoric and becoming genuinely faithful uh, to Steve's celebration of, of real contract law in, in this area, with taking contracts seriously, taking state contract law uh, seriously. And that would mean sacrificing the court's national policy favoring arbitration. The first principle would be federal deference to state courts and state contract law. I'd be impressed if the court makes that switch in, in the AT&T case. It's there for the taking, uh, but my guess is that only Justice Thomas, as he has repeatedly done, uh, will take that position. Uh, and we'll see a continued instantiation of this rhetoric reality gap. So uh, as much as I would like to, I doubt I'll have to include arbitration cases in my contracts course after all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. I'd, uh, I'd like to turn um, uh, the qu uh, questions over to uh, the audience in a moment. I I'd like to give the panel an opportunity to ask questions or provide comments uh, to any of the other presentations they've seen. I'd like to, to start that off by um, asking uh, Professor Seabach a bit about um, the practical side of the alternative litigation finance developments. In particular, you know, I've read these New York Times articles that talk about these big investment funds that are starting to put money uh, into buying these uh, commercial claims or to investing these commercial claims. I'm just curious, um, are these big investment funds making any money? How, how, how do things seem to be panning out for, for their investments? Uh, well, we um, can look at publicly traded corporations uh, in the common law systems outside the United States to see how they've been faring in other common law uh, jurisdictions such as Australia, Canada, and uh, the UK. And um, the answer there is that they're making money but not as much as they think they thought they would. Uh, certainly uh, Juridica, which is publicly traded, um, has had a pretty good run since it first floated its first uh, 80 million pound um, issue in 2008. Uh, the experience in uh, Australia has been interesting where there's been a bubble and a burst of that bubble in companies that formed in response to a um, uh, Australian Supreme Court decision allowing investment in class actions. That's actually where class action investment is occurring is in Australia and now maybe Canada. Um, and there are reasons for procedure we can talk about is why certain jurisdictions are amenable and not amenable to class actions as a form, as, a, as an object of investment. But Australia has actually been a, a disaster. Um, and uh, in the United States, my uh, sense is that the um, that we need to talk about two sectors. The the the, the consumer side seems to be doing fine. Um, What's interesting to me is not whether or not they're making money, but what's happening to the um, rate of return they're demanding on their investment, uh, something my colleague Lester Brickman keeps constantly coming to my office and asking me to give him hard numbers on, because uh, Lester is convinced, given his work on contingency fees, um, that the uh, rate of returns 
uh, should be astronomical. But what's interesting is that their returns are certainly much higher than those which uh, than lawyers can command from their own clients. And they're doing the same thing. They're lending money to the client, right? And what's interesting is a lawyer can't command usually higher, according to my numbers, 33% to 40%, according to Lester, 1,000%. But whatever it is, what's interesting is that the, um, the, 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 the consumer side companies um, are get, were once demanding about 300%. And now they're under 100%. Uh, and this is actually, I think, made a huge difference on re from the regulatory point of view. The New York State Attorney General's office pushed them really hard to be transparent about um, their numbers when they actually entered into a consent agreement to allow them to continue going forward without being regulated on the upper rate of return. On the uh, commercial side, uh, the industry is very young. Um, the average size of the deals between one and two million dollars is a handful of deals above ten million dollars. There are probably, I'm going to guess, about a hundred deals being done a year right now, um, and they're doing okay. Um, certainly, every indication I've seen suggests to me that the uh, that the industry is doing fine. What's interesting is there is that the industry is not growing as fast as I thought they would. New entrants are not coming in. We still only have four to five major players right now in the United States. Very interesting. Um, I also have a question um, about the uh, AT&T case uh, for uh, Steve and, and Larry, and that is um, in the AT&T case, it's uh, not just a question about uh, whether a class action waiver is unconscionable or, and, and whether that uh, unconscionability is preempted. But there's also um, an issue in the case uh, that um, goes to the inducements uh, that AT&T has offered to um, its customers in arbitration. There are various sweeteners to encourage people to bring claims uh, individually in arbitration. And so my question is, could, uh, could you describe what some of those sweeteners are and what role do you think those sweeteners might play in um, resolving the case of whether these waivers are, um, uh, uh, are going to be enforced? One of the provisions, as I recall and understand it, is that um, if an individual brings a one-on-one -on -one arbitration and wins uh, a certain amount, the company would pay them even more than that. So the, the company has, I think, gone far to design this adhesion contract uh, to be fair. Nevertheless, the state law is, is quite clear. It includes a statutory basis and some jurisprudence and common law decisions uh, that arrangements that tend to insulate a person from the commission of torts, fraudulent acts, uh, are unconscionable. They're unenforceable as, as a matter of uh, long-standing state policy uh, th to the extent that a device like this, even with a feature like that, can have the effect of, dis of enabling an enterprise to extract small amounts from large numbers of people, which this might well do, uh, then under that recognized body of law, this uh, uh, contract would be illegal and un unconscionable. So, To me, the question is, how ambitious ought the Supreme Court and the federal apparatus be in supervising state legal judgments? And at the oral argument, uh, many justices were concerned about this, including uh, Justice Scalia cause, and Kagan, because I, I think that they don't feel equipped uh, to navigate the real common law of contracts. They're not good at it. They don't have a lot of experience with it. They don't have a lot of interest in it. Uh, and so I think they're quite hesitant to, to, to try to uh, evaluate <coughs> whether that feature of the AT&T arrangement m makes this a fair uh, contract. I think it's, uh, they, they, they're hesitating and thinking, we really ought to defer to California on that one. And. Um, so I, it will be an interesting uh, case. This is a prime opportunity for the court to, to resolve this tension with, between, and for, for, you know, for this audience, um, uh, deference to states or aversion to litigation. I mean, I think that's what's at stake. Um, and as I said, early on when the court began this expansion, this, this view of a national policy favoring arbitration, which began in 1983 based on a 1925 statute, O'Connor, Black, I think Rehnquist a little, were very concerned, and Scalia, they objected. They, this is not the federal court's business. Um, but after 20 years of this, 
O'Connor and Scalia said, look, we give up. We've got 20 years of big cases, so as a matter of stare decisis, we're going to capitulate. Um, Justice Scalia did announce in that very uh, case that if he could find a majority of people to reverse this line, he'd like to do that. There is a chance, that Thomas has always dissented on this ground, there is a chance that he could find it uh, with Alito and Roberts. They haven't really indicated strongly their, their orientation in this field. So I think it's a momentous case for this, for this jurisprudence, I think. But to, to summarize, Brian, that f I, I think the, 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 the features, the detailed contractual content here is something I don't think the Supreme Court wants to get in the business of, of, of weighing. I think that would be a mistake. I, I hope they do. I don't think it would be a mistake. I think this topic Brian raises is a great example of the point I was raising earlier about clash of two worldviews. The, the FAA enacted in the 1920s prior to the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure class action uh, procedures, right? So we, we have class actions, this, this creature of recent years, clashing with the Federal Arbitration Act from the 1920s. And uh, it, if you take the, the, the more recent mindset that's used to class actions as sort of a right that people with small claims need to have, then you view the FAA as, as this, you know, why is it, why is it trampling on this, this right that consumers with $30 claims uh, need, to, need to have? Uh, by, by contrast, if you say, hey, U.S. Supreme Court's got to look at a federal statute, the FAA, and look at the federal rules of civil procedure and, and law and class actions and harmonize the two, figure out some way to make them both work together, just that sort of statutory interpretation job that courts have to do when they've got more than one body of law that seem to be bumping into each other, seems to me a very sensible way for the court to do that is to say, we give respect to the class action law by holding some of these arbitration clauses unenforceable when they totally deprive uh, access to justice for small claims, defeating the big point of class actions. But on the other hand, we got to respect the FAA and what it's saying too, and hold enforceable arbitration clauses that do provide the sort of sweeteners, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, Brian talked about, that do make it feasible for uh, consumers with small claims to bring those claims in arbitration. And AT&T's clause is a great example of that, where they're basically incentivizing consumers, go ahead, bring your claim as an individual. And, and I have no illusions about AT&T's uh, generosity to consumers. I assume they're self-interested, and they're saying, you know what, we fear class action plaintiff's lawyers a lot more than we fear individual customers bringing $30 claims. A lot of those... A lot of those $30 claims are AT&T never... AT&T is in the back there. <laughs> a lot of those $30 claims are never going to get brought because, as Tony says, consumers going to lump it. Or consumer says, you know what, I'm just going to switch to Sprint or Verizon or what, what, whatever. Is that a bad world? Is that a bad world where every $30 claim doesn't get brought? If you're the class, class action plaintiff's lawyer, well, then yes, it's a bad world, right? And we need to trample on the FAA to keep class actions alive. Tony, you have a view on this? Yeah, well, it's just an a, a interesting example of how the technology, so to speak, of civil procedure can be readapted. So um, one, uh, one alternative way to approach the problem that AT&T versus Concepcion raises, which is a very serious problem, I think the preemption issue is the interesting one for me, because preemption and tort law is very interesting to me. But if I wanted to get away from this problem, I would say, okay, uh, let AT&T have the law at once, and now let's create a market, a very inexpensive market, by which all these individual claims can be um, made liquid and assigned to a single holder. And I have cases from 1900 where this happened in the United States, and this is exactly what's happening in Australia. That is the class action investment market that exists in Australia, where, per, where um, investors are buying hundreds of thousands of claims and bringing them hold, as the holder of 100,000 claims. Okay, fine. Then we don't need to have this fight anymore. And to Tony, quick question. If, if you had that market, but AT&T's consumer contract says this claim is non-assignable, Okay, now you, now you got me. That's the next generation yeah. of arbitration clause. Yeah. Well, under the rhetoric reality gap, you can get around that. <laughs> Shall we turn it over to the audience? Do you guys have any more comments for each other? Should we turn it over to the audience? Okay. Any, any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Seabock, I thought you made a good point that I don't see anything particularly wrong with one person suing and asserting rights of another. Would you say that, that would you make the same argument with regard to, oh, 
Would you make the same argument with regard to constitutional law and standing to assert the rights of others uh, there, or do you think that Article Three imposes perhaps perhaps it, it incorporates these common law era limits on suing on behalf of, of other people? I'm pausing because uh, this is a question which I I know I can't answer. Okay, and, I've, and, it, and I'm going to avoid it, okay? So the, first, I mean, give you, so the answer is, my gut is that uh, the standing doctrine which is developed has got to be respected here, and I think it trumps all other concerns I may have about the um, autonomy rights of a right holder to transfer as a piece of property, because I actually don't think public law rights are property in the same way. And that's my quick answer, okay? But then, then I, want to, I want to pivot now and avoid the embarrassment that I can't really give you a good answer to talk about how your question illustrates other problems that I think exist, and I want to make myself look good by saying that I have thought of other hard questions <laughs> I can't answer. And, and here are some other ones, right? Um, this is exactly the problem. It's analogous to uh, allowing investment in family law questions. Uh, so the New York Times did run this article about this uh, lawyer in California who's begun an investment company to invest in divorce cases. And it makes perfect sense. And in fact, we have an example from the UK where there was a, uh, a litigation investment company of some significance who is publicly traded and invested in a $400 million divorce case, which is really the same thing as investing in a $400 million corporate dispute uh, between a woman and her very wealthy husband. In the, in the California context, it's, it's, these are $2 and $3 million uh, estates that are being battled over. It makes perfect sense. And her argument as to why this is a good thing is it allows women mostly women, to, uh, to litigate with, with the kind of resources they need in order to get their full fair share, okay? The problem is uh, the control question. Do you want to give an outside uh, investor any kind of control here that you might give them in other uh, commercial cases regarding terms of settlement, and especially if terms of settlement include things like visitation rights? I mean, do you really want to give an outside investor the right to say, I have a veto power as to whether or not you take, right? So these are hard questions, and, and actually I have been toying, because I teach remedies, with the idea of whether or not anything I've said today translates into injunctive relief, okay? Whether or not you can assign a case involving injunctive relief. It's an interesting problem. So the answer to your question is, um, I want to I like take care of the little, the little corner I've, I've bitten off already, um, and then I'm going to worry about the larger conceptual problems, which I think are huge. And I don't think, though, that the fact I can't answer your question suggests that the answers I've already provided are illegitimate. Tony, is it, uh, just, just one quick uh, follow-up on that. Is there a practice now, even in the commercial cases, where the investors have some kind of control over the, the case? It's extremely controversial because um, the answer I'm about to tell you now, I guess I have to phrase very carefully. Um, the state law on this varies dramatically. Therefore, um, different investment agreements will be worded very carefully to fit the state law as it's currently perceived. And uh, the answer to your question then is it depends on the state. Um, and, and, and so uh, investors would like to have as much control as possible, obviously. Um, and whether or not they can have as much control they want without risking having their contract voided for public policy, in which case they basically lose um, the upside of their investment because the person, the counterparty, walks away and doesn't have to give them anything other than the investment plus statutory interest. That is something that they don't want to risk. Gotcha. But there are all sorts of interesting devices that have been inserted to try and get control over um, certain key issues. And the key issues are, are basically settlement amount and selection of attorney. <laughs> uh, but sometimes it can be over other things as well. Interesting. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to ask a quick question about ALF and fee shifting. Number one, are the financers liable if there's fee shifting against the plaintiff? And number two, does the existence of ALF perhaps mean we ought to rethink the American rule? The American rule is designed to give people access to courts, and if they now have access to courts through ALF, there's the externality that then they're imposing a cost on the defendant, and now there's access, so shouldn't there be more routine fee shifting? So a you know, quick answer to your question is I'm not familiar right now with any um, adjudicated claim by a, uh, a, a winning party in an American case in which was conducted under a fee-shifting statute, and typically they're not. I mean, let me stress again that right now the real world of ALF is commercial contract dispute, okay? Not employment discrimination, 
lot of them have fee shifting provisions. Okay, well, in which case, I'm, then let me just say, I was thinking more about statutory fee shifting provisions. Um, I have not yet seen an adjudicated dispute where a uh, fee shift has been claimed by the winning party because they've been, first of all, a lot of these parties don't know that there is a funder behind the other party. And it's, a, it's currently controversial in the jurisdictions that permit ALF as to whether or not there's mandatory disclosure and whether or not even if there's net ma mandatory disclosure, whether or not there's even um, disclosure permitted, okay? That's an aside to a point. To answer your question, though, by analogy, this issue has been carefully and heavily litigated in England. And the English courts came to the conclusion, because of course of the vicissitudes of the English rule, that in fact um, funders are on the hook for the cost of the, uh, of, of the prevailing party in, in, on the other side, which of course um, changed the economics of ALF to some extent uh, and actually gave her a huge boost uh, to after the event insurance markets. Should it make us rethink the American rule? Can I pass on that question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, uh, you'll be second. We have a person with the microphone, please. Go ahead. Yep, uh, Jason Yaki, University of Wisconsin. I've got a question for, uh, for Larry and Steve. Uh, the ATT uh, v. Concepcion case is really, really interesting, fascinating, really, really tough issues. And I guess I'm wondering if you guys think that we could have avoided the really hard issues. Um, and the way that I, my problem with when I, when I teach the case um, to my students, um, the, the problem the students have is that the case, the way it's talked about, is really framed as an, as an arbitration case when it's really a waiver of class action case. And so we, in, in I, as I recall, um, in the ATT contract, we actually had an arbitration clause and then separately a waiver of your right to participate in class actions in the contract. Um, and so the way it's been presented, we have this very difficult issue of, of how do we apply the FAA to the class action waiver and preemption and unconscionability in Section 2 of the FAA. And what I'm wondering is whether or not we would have been better off if we kept those issues separate. Because um, you can imagine that AT&T would have, it, it, the FAA issue would go away if all we were talking about was whether states as a matter of public policy can prevent their citizens from waiving their rights through a contractual clause to participate in class actions. And so the problem for me is really this idea that we're reading into all arbitration clauses um, automatically a waiver of your right to participate in a class action lawsuit. And if we didn't do that, we'd force companies like AT&T to put in a specific clause. And then we could talk about whether those specific clauses are enforceable outside of the FAA framework. And so I guess I'm wondering if, you, if you, either of you think that it was a mistake to read class action waivers into all arbitration clauses? Would we, would we have been better off practically or doctrinally to really keep those two issues separate? I guess, I guess I see this as an example of every case is different, every contract is written, written differently. So even, even if the contract in the AT&T case gives you the out that you've described, we can imagine soon the next case where the clause is written in light of that Stolt-Nielsen case I had up on the screen where it's just a plain vanilla silent arbitration clause and then won't we be back to the same challenge that the court will have to deal with the hard issue you're able to duck on well, this I mean, one. So, so I, I guess I'm asking you whether you think Stolt-Nielsen should have come out the other way. So an arbitration clause by itself does not, um, does not include an implicit waiver of the right to participate in a, in a class action. Right? And so you're forcing the companies to actually set that out yeah, I don't have a strong view of whether Stolt Nielsen should have come out the other way. I more take it as that's what the Supreme Court has said, and now the ball's in Congress's court if it wants to do something different. I, I'm sympathetic to the to the critique and, and, and the prescription. One problem with Stolt Nielsen was as Ginsburg, this is an opinion by Alito, and he, he did signal a little bit his, his propensity here, which I think is to really, really uh, drive this rhetoric regali reality gap I'm talking about, because as Ginsburg explained in dissent, the arbitrators in that, in that case had relied on, on state contract law to decide that what that clause meant. That if, if the parties had agreed to ask the arbitrator, does this mean that we can do this by, as a, on a class basis or not? And there's a terrific New York Court of Appeals opinion that answers that question. The arbitrators apply. And Alito decided that the arbitrators were wrong in that. that they, uh, he doesn't even talk about how well they found a New York Court of Appeals case and applied it. He said, oh, they were just imagining their own public policy world. And that public, that's wrong. That's not allowed. They exceeded their powers under this federal statute. They're not allowed to do that. In, this, in the course of that uh, architecture, he repeats the litany of, this is all about contracts, this is all about contract law. Well, that, but that's not what he did. 
Uh, and, and I think you could simplify all these cases by saying this is only about whether the state law is preempted or not. So, I mean, that's how I would simplify it. And what I got from the oral argument in this case, in at and was that there is at least some concern among the justices about their capacity uh, to second guess, to really review uh, state decisions. So I, I think this is a good way to simplify uh, the, the, the case. And I, but I, my prediction is that, that that will not happen. I think it will be a continuation of this, this rhetoric reality complexity. Yes, sir. Uh, a comment and a question for Anthony Seabach. First of all, the comment, you began by saying that your views would make it obvious that you're not a member of the Federalist Society. Well, you've been supporting freedom of contract. Uh, sounds like a good Federalist to me. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think you're generating a whole lot of hostility in this room. Uh, the uh, question is this, just a factual question. Uh, as a corporate person, it occurs to me that one way to finance uh, litigation by a business entity would be to assign the investor a special security, say tracking stock, that would be tied to the uh, revenue from the suit. I would assume that would be viewed as a ploy that would uh, fail the uh, Champerty statutes, but has anyone tried that and do you, is there any possibility that that would fly under the Champerty statutes? It was just tried last month. Uh, yeah. I can't comment on it. Oh, you can't comment on it. Because I, was I tried it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a question for Professor Seabach. Uh, my name is Jeff Pojanowski from Notre Dame. And I'm interested that the that the ALF um, hasn't evolved on the on the class action side of the cons on, on the consumer side of the ledger, and because um, I can see possibilities where that you know from an agency cost perspective that could be better. You know, you, you might be less likely to have a situation in which the lawyers settle for coupons for the for for the plaintiffs and and, and they get fees if you if you know people are just in it for money. Um, so I'm wondering why it's only gone along the individual claim perspective. Is, is it because, is it the difference in the rate of return in the sense that a plaintiff's lawyer will take a 33% cut, whereas, you know, on the individual consumer one, you're looking at a 100% rate of return? Is it basically, you know, is, is essentially the plaintiff's bar ALF that has a really, has a really thin rate of return and there's, and there's no kind of market to exploit, or? Well, I mean, uh, the uh, simplest answer is, and I was talking to Brian about this before the panel began. Um, in order for there to be uh, the assignment or the, uh, of, of, a, of a whole claim or the uh, assignment of a, uh, of, a, of, a, of a part of a claim, in this case, part of the recovery uh, of, the, of the claim, there needs to be a, uh, a, a contract between a, a natural person and, and another natural person. Now, uh, ALF investors are natural persons, even if they're corporations for purposes of the law. A class is not. That is the simple reason why, so far, it's never been done. I mean, it's really not, I hate to say it, rocket science. It's just that no one's figured out um, how to put a square peg into a round hole. Now, I am writing an article about how this could be done. Um, the question is whether or not Rule 23 and its state equivalents need to be amended or whether or not we could ask uh, courts to begin under their equitable powers to supervise the, um, uh, the splitting up of the uh, contingent recovery that belongs to this fictional creature called the class. But then the question is who, um, who actually is the counterparty? It, can, it, 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 may be, it might be class counsel, but that raises huge problems and then I actually think that the Federal Society themselves may ally themselves with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in opposing all this, okay? Because there's an anxiety about the uh, about the role of class counsel here. It could be the, the court, right? It could be the court, but the court may not be equipped or be interested in, in taking on that responsibility. Then who's it going to be? Is it going to be a trustee? I mean, now we're going to produce epicycle upon epicycle upon uh, who speaks for the class. So that's the practical problem and the theoretical problem. All those problems add up to why. Um, now, there have been kind of, um, um, uh, kind of behind the scenes ways of doing the same thing. Okay, to go back to this earlier question. There have been ways to, to do it in some sense under the cover. And, and that is to have the class council um, take off a piece of their recovery and try to transfer it to an outside investor. But that's of course illegal under the claim splitting question. 
Okay, so then all they can do there is they can model it as a kind of loan. Uh, and that raises its own problems as well about whether or not they can do that without um, at least lead counsel and if not uh, the court then supervising that decision. Well, this has been a terrific panel, but unfortunately I think we're uh, out of time. But uh, please join me in thanking the panel for their time. <laughs>